Thank you for coming to the Museum for Art and Wood um, on a Friday night of a beautiful, beautiful day of a crazy Philly weekend. Mm -hmm. um, it's really it's um, really wonderful to end what has been a really meaningful exhibition for us with um, the four voices that we have joining us today. It's, um, we've been looking forward to this particular program um, since, since before we even opened the show. And um, so it's extra meaningful to end in this way. Um, this is an exhibition about um, humanity and its relationship to tools. And it's um, um, not only its urge to create things, but its urge to decorate and ornament and apply skill and develop skill and materials and um, to create beautiful and useful things that help us think about other concepts, about cosmic energies and, um, and then also our own bodies. So this show really does swing between the um, ephemeral and corporal, um, literally. And um, so I'm going to hand it over to Katie, who is um, going to be our moderator today. This is her, this program is her story. And her, Katie. Um, Katie is our director of outreach and communications. It changes um, so many times. So. <laughs> well, we've, we've had that one for a while. Yeah. So I should get it right. Um, and Katie has been with the museum for almost over seven years. Over seven years. Mm -hmm. um, Katie has a BFA in is it metals? Metals and jewelry. Metals mm -hmm. and jewelry from the Cleveland Institute of Art. Mm -hmm. um, she has lived in many American cities, from New Orleans to Milwaukee, mm -hmm. um, Connecticut. Connecticut someplace in Connecticut yeah. and, and Philadelphia. We're really um, happy she's here. She's indispensable to uh, our organization and the museum and our community. Um, she's also an extremely accomplished artist, not only in metals and jewelry, but also drawing um, and, and well, some paper. Mm -hmm. So she's going to bring all of that to this conversation and introduce our guests. And I'm going to sit back and Enjoy the show. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. And um, thank you for being here on this spring-like evening at the Museum for Art and Wood. Um, it's really exciting to be able to say museum now. Um, before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge that um, the Museum for Art and Wood is located on the land of the Lenni Lenape Nation. We honor those who steward these unceded lands, past, present, and future. Um, so tonight's uh, talk, we're gonna be talking about the Vessel Philadelphia, which is a, a panel discussion about the art and containment of today's makers. And um, for this evening's talk, we've um, invited local artists um, to have a conversation about how the form of the vessel inspires their work um, this event is celebrating also the closing of this exhibition, um, which uh, I'm sad to say its last day with us is this Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, um, February 12th. Um, uh, just loved having all of these beautiful works uh, living with us for the past few months. So thank you, Nava, for um, being the amazing um, curator um, for this exhibition. Um, I'd like to welcome our panelists, our amazing artists tonight who are joining us to share um, their journey um, with the vessel, uh, with all of us. Um, from, um, we'll go from left to right. We have Sid Carpenter, who's representing Team Clay. <laughs> <laughs> um, then we have Miriam Carpenter. Team Wood also no relation, same last name. <laughs> we don't know that. That's true. There, there very well could be some connection there. We never know. Um, but that's another show. <laughs> um, then we have representing Team Glass, Jason McDonald. And then my team, Metal, we have Kate Dannenberg. So 
thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, our lovely faces here. So I have um, you guys going in alphabetical order. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, share a little bit about your where you come from, your background, um, why you're working in the materials that you're working with. And we have some pieces um, that you sent me that we'll be talking about this evening. So Miriam, you're up. I am an independent artist out of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And I have always um, made things. I've always been a creative um, person. And so I decided, oh, and I, and I decided that I wanted to get an education, an art education that provided me with practical skills. So I went to Rhode Island School of Design and I was intending on studying architecture because I didn't want to be a starving artist. And then uh, fell in love with the industrial design department and all of the tools and all of the programs that they offered. And so I studied industrial design and I focused on material exploration and photovoltaic systems with quantum dots. And then I graduated and I worked with Mira Nakashima at George Nakashima Studio in New Hope, PA for about seven years. And then I can't believe it's almost been nine years, but wow. almost nine years now I've been an independent artist. And I work primarily in wood, but I like to explore the mundane and uh, patterns in nature and uh, mathematics and music and experiment and incorporate those things and translate them into sculpture um, and sculptural furniture. Can you want to talk a little bit about these pieces? Sure. Um, that, is this, on? it is? Okay. This, yeah, that's it's going right into here for the, okay. <clears throat> for the recording. Okay. Um, that is an end table um, out of soft maple, and it was designed to be a turning, uh, inside out turning. So, uh, if you are, to, if you can see some of that pattern, the blown up pattern that I've stenciled on the outside of the table, that's the cross section um, rotated in random patterns on the outside of the table. Um, the other side of that has a drop, a uh, little droplet form. That is a piece of English oak burl that I carved uh, into a feather. And it's 36 high, bleached with an ash base and sterling silver stanchion. And those, these are really the only pieces that I do um, series of the rest of the pieces are essentially one-off pieces, uh, and those are hand-carved um, red oak in holly boxes with museum glass, and each of the feathers are about four and a half inches long. Beautiful. And that is a console table, and uh, it's called the second overtone, and that's a representation of a mathematical curve or a Lisa Joux curve um, in music. And the base is ebonized, uh, chemically ebonized soft maple, and the top is spalted maple with little bronze standoffs. Gorgeous. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, we're going to move next to Sid. Sid Carpenter. I'm an, a clay artist and have been for pro probably my entire career, my entire um, experience as an artist and I came to that through Tyler School of Art coming there as a painter and then taking the elective courses that they offer and meeting a, a very very important and influential person in my life Rudolf Staffel and Rudolf Staffel gave me this sense of confidence enabling and um, it was this whole idea that I could become an artist working in clay. And especially since I had been offered the opportunity to go to Penn to become a doctor. So 
the wow. idea that my parents did not in any way object to this choice that I made. Um, you know, you're, you're thinking about you know this young black woman in the '70s, and you think about what's going on in the '70s, and you know my choice, my decision, um, which was accepted by my parents that I would prefer to be an artist and not to become a, a physician. So I just moved through all of the stages of going to graduate school, establishing a studio. Um, my husband, Steve Donegan, is back there. We had um, established a studio up here on Spring Gardner Street that has over 100 artists' studios in it. Meanwhile, I'm doing some teaching, um, eventually teaching at Swarthmore College, which I recently retired from, which is has been even though that was a wonderful place that was supportive and nurturing and stimulating in every single way, uh, retiring from there or leaving from there. And I like to eliminate that word um, retire because I do not feel like I have re retired. I mean, that to me sounds like a way of retreating mm -hmm. and I, I am in no way in retreat. So I, um, have since retiring, and it's only been about six months or so, um, I've been involved in a number of different projects that allow me as a clay artist to work um, on public projects, be out on the land, and just, in, you know, just to have these um, connections with all of these different kinds of artists and ways of making and ways of thinking. So it just my progress, and I, I feel like it's this ongoing pro a process that's going on, and there's so much more to explore and learn about and um, to take chances with, because I think that that's really the issue around an artist is this issue of growth. And so I feel like I am feeling very, very, um, I don't know, uh, just full of possibility right now. So it's it's really a, a, a good place for me to be. So I can talk about some of the works that are relative to this idea of vessel. One of the things that's been key to my content for the past several years is the um, experience of African American people on the land. That's really crucial to me as stewards, not as a, a burden, not as something to escape from. It's something to move towards. So I've identified um, different farms, gardens, people that are still on the land. Um, I call them legacy farmers because many of them have been on the farms for multiple generations um, since uh, uh, emancipation and beyond um, for, for decades and decades. So I do portraits of their places. Um, and so I've done sculptural pieces, freestanding pieces, wall pieces, and now I'm involved with a series of bowls, um, which I call farm bowls. And this is O'Neill Smalls. One of the things that's important to me is identifying these farmers who otherwise would be anonymous. And I think of these farmers who have been able to retain their land to establish places where their families can come to and return to um, and to thrive. Um, there, there's a legacy there. I think of them as, as courageous. And so not to name them would be participating in that, that whole experience of being obscured and having your history and having your impact on the culture being just denied. So this is O'Neill Small. Um, he has a farm in South Carolina, and it is called Freewoods. And what's unique about Freewoods is it is a place that exists right now, currently, um, and it only uses animals and people. It is, n nothing is um, mechanical in terms of being um, industrial, run by gasoline, run by electricity. Everything is hand done with animals. So this is a, a bowl um, that has one of the animals, which is a mule, and there's, a, there's always in, in these bowls, there's a structure, there's a, a building, some architecture. The brain underneath speaks to who is fueling this, who is 
continuing this. The, the you know, the, the idea that they're to continue this, there are ideas, um, there are uh, connections. So it's not only a hands-on thing, but there is also this idea of um, language, of connection. Um, so that's what the what you would call the base of it is. It, it's a brain. So this is another one. Um, uh, this is uh, Lori. Uh, Lori Adams, I think her last name is, I'm, I'm blanking on her last name, but she um, raised chickens, different colors of eggs, and, and once again, the brain is there, and so it, it's a vessel in and of itself, but it's also a place, and it identifies Lori and her effort as a farmer. Um, this is not, obviously, a vessel, but that's what's important, is that notion of how the vessel itself manifests itself. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that you have containment and how that containment can be described in a formal way. So, you know, in looking as a gardener myself, and I'm very much a very avid, intense, passionate gardener, one of the things that I notice in my garden is the shapes of leaves. But leaves are flat for the most part. They don't have flesh. There's, there's, they're not um, visceral in the sense of uh, what we would think of as a body. But I imagined certain leaves. What would happen if you were to blow into them? And they did expand. And so this piece, which is called Old Soul, it's a uh, let's see, it's about 36 inches long. Um, and when I imagined the leaf that I had taken from the garden and expanded it, it turned into an animal. And I, and I love that kind of transition, that formal transition, and, and just how something becomes because you take it beyond what you imagine its boundaries are. And that's a way of also thinking about vessels, um, you know, in terms of containment. What's contained? Where are its boundaries? And so it's another way of thinking about the vessel. Thank you, Sid. Hi, uh, I'm Kate Dannenberg. I'm from Philly and I'm back in Philly and I'm a jewelry and metal artist. Um, I don't know anything about what I do right now. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I- That happens. <laughs> Does. It does. Um, in addition to jewelry, I make um, housewares and functional and non-functional objects, um, and especially vessels. I love vessels. Um, it's a big part of my work, um, functional and non-functional. Um, so this is one box. I'm really interested in the way that we, as humans, interact with objects and the way that both the person and the object are affected by that interaction. So this copper box is in three parts that stack together. And the what's really lovely about it to me is the way that the oxidation has changed with the fingerprints of, of people opening it and closing mm -hmm. it. So yeah. the interior is still completely shiny from the pieces sliding in and out and being closed. And then the bottom piece just has that little pinch of fingerprints on it, plus a little bit from being handled. Um, and the way that, th the way that um, precious versus everyday objects get handled so differently is really fascinating to me, especially as a jeweler, where jewelry is this precious thing, but it's also very much an everyday thing, with, especially with wedding bands, engagement rings, that kind of thing. Uh, this is a worry stone. I made the first one of these a few years ago, some years ago, um, when I was at Penland taking a class on vessels and hollow construction. Um, and I was thinking about containment and holding and being held. And so this is an object to hold and it says right on it, it wants you to hold it. Uh, this is just a simple copper box I made. Um, the little handle thing on the top is an African porcupine quill. 
Um, I had made some spoons with quills similar to that many years ago and then had pictured this box for about 10 years and finally got around to making it. Um, this is uh, hollow constructed, so it's just flat sheet and soldered together. And I intentionally leave the seams pretty visible so you can see the seam on the bottom and then the seam centered on the back is really obvious because the, you know, I made it and it's made and you can see how it was made because mm -hmm. I left the seam there and you can see the file marks from shaping the, the piece. And um, these are a pair of vessels that started a series of vessels. Um, I made them at the Baltimore Jewelry Center in 2020. Um, I was making a series of objects that were where their primary function was just to be held. Um, so these can work as bud vases um, or, you know, any little cuppy thing, but they're pretty small. Um, mm -hmm. They're hand sized. Um, and I originally conceived of them as um, something to sort of fill with water or not and put in the freezer. So when you come inside and it's you're dying of heat, you have this nice, cold, smooth surface Genius. to cool off with. Um, <laughs> thank you. <Yeah. laughs> I get very warm very easily. <laughs> um, and as I said, this was in 2020. So a lot of my work at the time of, of this series, I was mm -hmm thinking a lot about anxiety and grounding objects and grounding yourself physically in the world by holding objects and by noticing the objects around you and that tactility and physicality. Amazing, thank you. Jason. Hi everyone, uh, Jason McDonald is my name. I'm a glass artist. I've been working with glass since 1998 where I first discovered it through a middle school program in Tacoma, Washington that uh, offered glass classes to, at the time they called them at-risk youth and they've, they've since changed the, <laughs> the, the brand a little bit, um, thankfully. Um, I have a huge amount of uh, gratitude and, uh, and, a, and a large debt to, to pay to this organization because they opened my eyes to a world that would not otherwise have been accessible to me. Um, I saw through that program an opportunity to, to live a life that um, really was beyond my comprehension because it's hard to imagine a life that you've never seen before. So I just want to give a shout out to um, youth organizations working in the arts. Um, and uh, if any of you have the chance to support one, please go out and do that. Uh, I'm currently an MFA student at Tyler School of Art, um, so it's good to have uh, an alum up here. Uh, I decided a couple of years back after years of um, being an artist assistant and working for other artists, uh, working in a, in a variety of factories and private studios, that uh, I was just sort of spinning my wheels and I had a skill set that I had developed over years and years that I wasn't... Um, applying to my own use. So I went uh, to get my BFA at California College of the Arts uh, five years ago now, and I'm continuing that journey here in Philadelphia. Um, art school is a weird place, man. <laughs> Super weird place. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful for the uh, all of the access and the um, exposure to a variety of new new ways of thinking, being, and making. Um, my passion is Venetian-style goblets. Um, I'm a, a really passionate maker of, of cups and, uh, and vessels, and that's probably why I'm sitting in this seat right now. Mm -hmm. um, this piece right here, I call it inclusion number three. Um, it's part of a series of work uh, where I explore um, getting dissimilar thicknesses of materials to work together. Uh, if any of you are familiar with glass, uh, they, they don't really like to play nicely together. So for me, this is uh, an exploration in, um, in material, but it's also talking about the, the vessel, um, particularly in the art world. Goblet making isn't seen as a, um, a valuable use of time. Um, it, functional vessels uh, are, are sort of looked down on and uh, 
I think of each cup as a little sculpture, um, an exercise in design and proportion. And so by removing the function of the cup and placing it in this block of glass, um, I'm, I'm really asking my viewer to, to examine an object that they might otherwise just dismiss. Um, this is some work that came out of my undergrad. Uh, it's really one of the first objects that I made that was trying to tell a story. Um, I had considered myself a craftsperson for many, many years, um, but not so much an artist. So I was asked to, to create a story with, with a work, and this is kind of what fell out. Um, this is talking about how black and brown folks are criminalized in our justice system at a really in, insane rate compared to other groups. Um, and, and this is me just sort of thinking through what it, what it means to exist in a nation like that. This is one of my more recent um, experimental vessels. It's based off of what's called the Guggenheim Cup. Um, essentially, the Guggenheim Cup uh, is a incredibly complicated vessel that was created in 16th century Murano um, and has since become sort of a standard for people within the glass world. Um, it's a symbol that cup makers make to prove to other cup makers that they know how to cup. <laughs> um, and so I, I took some of the, the fundamental elements of that, uh, that, that goblet and incorporated them into my own uh, styling. Um, there's no central axis, so it's all the weight of the pieces distributed over um, an arch or an arching framework. It stands about, oh gosh, 28 inches high, so it's totally non-functional. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I'm really excited for, for where it's at, it's, uh, or where it's going, rather. Um, Jason, I just want to point out your your last um, sentence from your your bio that you sent in, which I think is really lovely. How you talk about um, one of your ambitions is to include building a home studio where you can invite a diverse group of people to come play at the furnace with an impeccably large garden, which we all love gardens, just outside of the workshop door. So you bring nature and craft and people and communities all together in one. So I thought that was really beautiful. So thank you for sharing that in your bio. All right, so we are gonna get started with the questions. Um, so when you hear the word vessel, how do you define it and what does it mean to you? Oh, sure. There's, there has to be um, some clarification, of course, because the word vessel in and of itself implies a certain kind of gravitas. Mm -hmm. It's not container. It's not a box. It's vessel. And so immediately we bring our associations to that word. Um, and so where do we experience vessels, especially if we're looking at it as an object? And generally it is in some kind of ceremony, ceremonial context. Um, it, it, you know, you find vessels in religious spaces, you find vessels in, um, art, in art galleries, those kinds of things. So you know, my idea around the vessel, of course, is to think about it um, maybe beyond those kinds of limited, and I think those are kind of limited ways of perceiving of the vessel, but at the same time acknowledging that our associations with it have to do with um, ways of containing mm -hmm. and, and what that object, what that idea is because it's, it allows for multiple interpretations. So when I think of vessel, I know immediately that I'm thinking about something that is going to um, go beyond something with defined edges, mm -hmm. and that we are able to think about 
the vessel as a container, the vessel as um, a place that stores and what are we storing? You know, our memories are vessels, mm -hmm. but there's no defining edge to it because that's infinite. So for me, the, the word vessel has to do with recognizing that it is something that um, expands and grows beyond uh, the meaning that most of us would come to it with. So it's, it could, it is a cup, but at the same time, it is your soul. It, at the same time, it is just being contained by community. There are all kinds of things that define um, the vessel for me. I agree with that completely. <laughs> um, I also feel that the, the vessel, when I think of the word, I feel comfort. I feel like it's providing a space for an offering. Um, but I also think of myself and other people and artists as being vessels for their creativity, for their talents, and that, and sometimes that's helpful, I think, for me to, to think about myself in that way. Um, it helps me get a little bit of distance from the work that I'm doing. Um, so if I'm a channel, if I'm a vessel, if I'm opening myself to allow the thoughts to come through me and pass into an object, I'm kind of removing myself a little bit so I don't have to be identify myself with what just came out. I'm the vessel for that. Uh, I was thinking a little bit about this question before I came here, um, and, I, and I wrote just a, a short thing um, that I'd like to read. Um, to me, vessel making is a symbolic gesture of, of radical hope. Um, I, I think about it in really temporal terms. Um, we create empty containers with the hope that they will be filled with uh, coffee or wine or preserves or flowers, um, or we hope that they'll be given as gifts and become cherished objects. Um, but really what they carry with them is the, the expectation of, of a future time that involves community and fellowship. Um, and, and that's, and that's oftentimes what I think about when I'm, when I'm making, um, my, my functional work. So. I'm pretty sure it's cheating to write ahead of time, so whatever. Um, but <laughs> yeah, all of that. <laughs> I guess. Um, There's no rules. <laughs> um, yeah, I think everything you guys have all said, I think that a vessel, our first association, at least my first association, is a physical object. Um, and sort of, as Sid was alluding to, vessel evokes like a Gre Grecian urn in a museum more than cup or container mm -hmm. or bowl. Um, but it's never just the physical thing. We're always thinking about it in terms of either what's on the outside, whether it's, a, again, a Grecian urn that have these like pictorial descriptions and we're learning about this culture from uh, investigating vessels um, or learn um, it's what the vessel held or what it will hold um, it's how it was made and who made it and why and the form and why is it that form and is that the right form for it to be um, and in terms of uh, people as vessels I think that um, it's a bit of a double-edged sword where I think that um, especially in American popular culture, we tend to, we often refer to women as vessels or like look mm -hmm. at them as vessels um, where we are really reducing bodies to objects. Mm -hmm. And it's not about what they can do, it's what they can hold for the viewer or the person interacting with this poorly written female character. Um, <laughs> uh, but then there's also um, main characters and a lot of things 
are underwritten so that they can be a vessel for the reader to put themselves in that character um, and into that person and story. Yes. Um, the notion that oh yes. <laughs> the notion that the female body is a vessel and therefore less than. And so I think about that in the opposite terms. I want to elevate that word, the female body as vessel, um, as something that is revered as a vessel. It's, it's not an issue of it um, of being objectified. It can be if we accept that, but I don't accept that. The fact that my body can act as a vessel is something to be cherished, to be honored, to be elevated, to be celebrated. Um, so, it, you know, it's an interesting use of language that we accept the, the, the fact that we have been diminished for the one thing that is so fabulous about us and so amazing about us. So that's why I want to react to that because I don't want to um, in, emphasize, enforce, and, and, and make that an acceptable thing that we just as women accept that us as vessels somehow makes us the pot, you know? And when we think about the pot, it's certainly not a vessel, you know, it's just a pot, you know? So my sense of it is just to flip that a little bit and get us to be able to think about our capacity as vessels in all its myriad um, interpretations from the actual physical capacity to what we are able to do. You know, I, I'm not interested in the idea that as women we're like men. No, we're women. And so there's something to be celebrated about that um, as opposed to being diminished by it. We're, we're going into territories that I, I, I love that we're there already. I, I didn't think we'd get there quite this quickly. Um, but I do, I do want to ask, since we're all in what's seen as craft-based materials, um, and you know the people don't talk about this as much as they used to, but like craft versus art. Um, but that takes me into functional vessels versus non-functional vessels and then how do you do you approach that do you deal with that in your own work um go <laughs> i do have a thing i didn't really think about it until now um that the feathers that i make are little, little vessels. vessels yeah and I hold them, and they're an offering. And I hold them, and they're non-functional. I mean, you can't, maybe for like a flower sifter or something, because <laughs> you can pour things through them. Um, but, uh, and I didn't listen to what you were saying, because I was just thinking. Oh, That's okay. You're, yeah. you're, you're getting there. You're talking about, you know, functionality versus non. Versus non-functionality. Yeah. And and, and, and why that? why do you maybe choose to go towards the non-functioning? Oh, right. With your well, work, because it doesn't really. I don't really care about yeah. the functionality or the non-functionality. If what I'm making is turns out to be functional, that's great. And you know, in terms of like this is a table or this mm -hmm. is a this or this is a this, and you can identify. But I also don't really like that because. It's an icon. People go to that and associate it with something else. And if you can create something that's functional, that moves beyond just being seen and compared to another icon, icon within that realm of language, form language, then that's great. Um, with the feathers, they're non-functional, but they serve a purpose for me consistently throughout my creative process to reset and to 
meditate and to hyper focus on what I'm doing and I hold them I don't use I use all different tools but I don't um, that I don't have a little sand thing or carving thing I hold them in my hand and I carve and so it's just I'm pouring myself into an object that has a life that's viscerally connected to me and embodies that um, So I have a question for you. So as you're working on, on one of these feathers, it is serving a purpose to you. It has a function right. for you. Right. Once that piece is finished, does it become non-functional to you personally? Yes. I get removed from them. I, it, the process, it's the process, and then I'm close to it at the very end, and then it's it can serve another purpose for someone else that, mm -hmm. you know, and it still does for me, if I'm looking at it, it will serve that, I guess, the similar, you know, function. Um, but uh, that's not why I keep making them. Um, this, this whole idea of functional versus non-functional, there's a word that's floating in my head and it's legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Because we have decided that function um, eliminates an object from being legitimately considered as contributing to culture. And so the cup that you drink your coffee out of in the morning and the vessel, um, one is considered legitimately uh, capable of receiving serious thought, and then the cup itself, well, it's your coffee, it's, it's a cup. So I'm arguing that, you know, the idea that we choose this way of imbibing through this object, Many of us have the favorite cup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Many of us collect cups. So there's this, now there's the hierarchy again, craft mm -hmm. versus, um, you know, art. And I think that it depends upon the object. Mm -hmm. The object is going to be evocative. So whether it's a cup that you got at the craft fair and you just fell in love with it, um, or it's the major vessel or the art object here, you know, one parsing that idea of what's legitimately cult about culture. So I think when it gets down to it, you know, what we bring into our homes speaks of culture, that speaks of values. And so the idea that you have this cup and it is pushed to the side so that you can devote your intellect and thinking and all of these things to the vessel. To me, I think that that's kind of missing the whole point of what it is to be human and what you value. Yeah. And so in terms of function, why should function be eliminated from the conversation? You know, that, that whole idea of how things function, you know, what do we want to bring to bear on its functionality? How does that function determine what the brain, you know, that ultimate vessel, how does that determine what's going to happen, you know, how valued that cup is? Granted, there will be cups that are manufactured and um, they're, they're industrial and we might say soulless, um, but then there's the spectrum trunk of the mm -hmm. cup that is acknowledged as a cup it's a cup but it's one of those things that i want to hold in the morning when i get up in the morning i have this rack of cups in my kitchen and it's very important to me to walk up to that rack and decide that one you know that i like that you know, and, and some get to be on the rack 
and some get to be in the back of the closet. <laughs> but there, it's still me as a person having that opportunity to make that choice. There's something about that that's kind of interesting. We could build on that. Um, we could build on the idea, that, the notion of, you know, I've con it's consumed, it's handmade. Some of them are made by my students, some of them I've collected. But there's mm -hmm. something about that, that dynamic of the cup and why is it not legit? And this other thing that's in my living room is, you know, I have a Don Nakamura sitting in my Don Nakamura is sitting right back there. And this <laughs> thing has pride of place. And it's a pot with color. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's, no, it's nowhere, it's in this special room. So, but I think that my experience with Don's pot and what I experience in the morning choosing my cup, that's legit. No, no. <laughs> Nava. I know where I'm, I'm not supposed to. No, be, that's fine. I, I know. you. <laughs> There's so much I want to say in response to that because that's why we're sitting here in this room, in this in this space is is that so much of how I got into this world as a curator not as a maker was because I was so drawn to the power and the potential of the recognized object mm -hmm. um, that human beings interact with every day and make choices about um, and the potential of an artist to use that power of familiarity and subvert it play with it, dress it up, um, and size it up, and do all these amazing things based on this object that we semiotically respond to in such um, a powerful and direct way. And so knitting, what you've done is like knit all of those things together. A cup exists on this continuum. There's the cup that you, that you drink, you put by your bedside so that in the middle of the night you wake up and you take a sip if you need to. There's the Donna Kavora piece that, that is <laughs> occupying pride of place and you stare at it and you get inspiration because it's sharing space with you. There's the Aaron Haba and the Miriam Carpenter. Um, and, and all of these things belong to a family, but they're saying different things to us. Thank you. Thank you for letting Thank me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> We've talked about this question for a little bit now, and I just want to uh, echo some of the words that I've heard up here already. Um, I think that it's a, a nonsense question, function versus non-function, um, and I think it's a misnomer. This this notion of non-functional is a is a misnomer. Um, whether or not you're using uh, We've been using the cup as an example. I happen to like that example. Um, <laughs> whether you're using your cup to hold your wine or if you're holding it as a special object on a, on a shelf somewhere, um, whether or not you're, you're using it daily or for special occasions, um, it's bringing something into your life. It's bringing uh, joy or beauty. It's bringing aesthetic. And I, and I think that those are functional um, I, I mean, I, I think that beauty is functional. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Like we yep. deserve beautiful objects in our lives. Um, it also brings me joy to make these non-functional objects or these functional objects, uh, whatever whatever you want to put, whatever label you want to put on them. I, I enjoy it, and that function for me is uh, a uh, a purpose and a passion. You know, mm -hmm. I I. Um, I just think that it's it's totally nonsense to try and break them into two separate categories. Yeah, I think basically all of that. I think that we define function very narrowly when mm -hmm. we're trying to make that distinction. And objects always have multiple functions and vessels mm -hmm. always have multiple functions. And I, of course, I'm a cup collector and I, I work in metal because I break glass and ceramics, um, but I love <laughs> glass and ceramics. And I have some pieces that I use every day because I know they can hold up to it. And I have some pieces that I use every day, even though I'm terrified I'm gonna break them. 
and I have some pieces that I almost never use because I know someday I'm going to break them and I want to hang on to them as long as I can in the meantime, but they're on display so I can look at them every day, even mm -hmm. though I can't hold them every day. And so they're, it's still serving this function. Um, and they also, objects in general and vessels can hold function, can, sorry, can hold the memory of where you got it or who made it or who gave it to you. Um, and they, if it's handmade, it holds sometimes literal fingerprints of the person who made it. Um, and certainly you can um, you just have the artist's expression in it, as well as like I have a cup that's, um, I work with Stacy Lee Weber, who's mm -hmm. primarily a metalsmith and jeweler, but I have a ceramic cup that she made in high school because it, she brought it to the place we used to work together and it was chipped, so they were gonna throw it out. And I was like, it still works, it's chipped, whatever. And so I use that every day and it has almost nothing to do with her work now, but it mm -hmm. is related to her as an artist and to our relationship as peers and becoming peers, because she's, I first encountered her work when I was in high school mm -hmm. and she had a solo show at the Metals Museum in Memphis and I was blown away by her work. And now I work very closely with her and all of that progress and all of that memory and relationship is held in this chipped ceramic cup. Mm. I so, love that. There's a lot of functions, I guess is what I'm saying. Can I just say one more thing about that? Um, I also think of every object I make as a type of vessel in that I've poured years of skill and labor into the object that I'm creating. Um, all of the practice that has come before resides within the, the bounds of the form that I've created. So uh, I, I think that it's, it also serves as sort of a, a time stamp, um, whether or not it's a, a functional object of, of what has come before it. I, I, yeah, that's fantastic. Because I, I think we forget, you know, we, we're so much sometimes in that moment that of where we came from. And each, each piece, it's you're growing. As you were talking about earlier, Sid, when you, in the introductions about, as an artist, you're, you're growing. You're always growing. And that's kind of our purpose here, right? To keep growing and learning and connecting. Um, we are, I'm going to do one more question and then I'm going to open it up to the um, audience here. Um, we're going to talk about Philadelphia. So if we want to define a vessel as, as a hollow container, and if you view a city as a vessel um, through boundaries um, that act as a form of containment, how would you define what a city such as Philadelphia contains and what is important about that? Only, only be, I'm jumping into it because I've lived here for so long, mm -hmm. most of my life. So I've seen it grow and change and seen the populations evolve and different areas become that I identify in a certain way become something else. So for me, it, it's a, Philadelphia as a vessel is a boat. Yeah. It's not the, the generalized, um, interpretation of, of a vessel in terms of containment in that way. It, it's something that moves, that floats, that bobs up and down. Um, it's, it's always, I, I love reading characterizations of the city in other magazines about it. it's the number one this, it's the worst that. <laughs> you know, it, all of these things that this city contains in its identity. Mm -hmm. And so as I've become older, I think about how I thought about certain things about the city when I was a teenager, when I was a young adult, when I was an artist. What is it like to be an artist in Philadelphia? What does that feel like? You know, how does it feel to be an older person in Philadelphia and, and seeing all of the changes that are happening? I, I, so it, it's impossible for me to put a label on Philadelphia as a container because it's moving all mm -hmm. the time.
Um, so I walked over to the river right before this and I was thinking about how a river is a vessel, but the thing that it contains is the thing that made the vessel. And I think from that, I was kind of like, oh, Philly's kind of held by these two rivers. But I think that a city holds so much, but the, the stuff that's contained in the city is also what's shaping the city and defining it and defining its boundaries and literally, you know, districting, mm -hmm. um, but also defining its identity and telling its history and painting murals all over all the time yeah. and decorating this vessel um, and sort of defining the edges of those rivers by putting piers in and being pushed back by the rivers when there's big weather events and not sure where I'm going with this, but push and pull. Yeah. I'm not from here and I got stuck in traffic on the way over. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm not the best person to talk about building. <laughs> no. But that's that's part of it though. <laughs> it should have, yeah, it should have. But you are from a port city that has traffic problems. <laughs> that's also true. <laughs> I don't really. I don't know if I have anything to say yeah. about. Not even as it seems to be Mike, because mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I have anything that I'm thinking of right now. It's good to say, um, but uh, in more more broadly, uh, your the place that you call your home, or the place that you. Um, it could be an idea, it could be place, it could be a feeling of where you have, where you contain that idea of home and identity. Um, that, uh, it's, it's a place that is your, your dominion of sanctorum, your sacred space. Um, you, it can encompass things like you know, what makes you feel comfortable living in a city with lots of your familiar places, the things you can access, those sort of things. But it's also, um, I think that uh, your the place that you call your home, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say and I'm thinking that it's, I'm getting there, um, that it's not just physical, but it's, it's emotional, spiritual mm -hmm. um, containment in, your your home space. My I think my my home has been many different places around. I've lived in not Philadelphia, but in Providence, and it just it's always constant. What I'm finding my my perception of the space around me and how I'm feeling in that um, kind of follows with me wherever I go, no matter where it is, whatever city it is, or if it's in a rural place. Great. No, 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 right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. Steve. Back in the day when I went to school in Carter, the issues of cultural versus non-cultural were sort of transposed to a painting version, mm -hmm. a painting class. And when I moved to New York City, there were camps of figurative versus non-figurative. And they were just so strident about keeping the polarity there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, within 10 years after that, it's like everything opened up and there was no need for any other definition. I mean, maybe within small camps there were. Yeah. But and I think the issue of cultural and non cultural is a just hugely beautiful, wonderful thing. It is really at the core of why the city sees the cups in the morning, the ways to not just the patron, but visually how beautiful it is. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I think that's really at the core of the things that we do is, is how do we create something that gives us a beautiful experience making it and to offer something to Keeping that conversation going. Yeah. I think this is an amazing conversation. Um, 
have questions, a lot of questions, but I'm going to stick to this one. Um, I'm a tribal artist, uh, and a lot of my work is around. Um, um, I try to address issues around black and brown folks, and so um, um, keeping it brief, this is your picture mm -hmm. of the which is absolutely beautiful. And I noticed in the bottom, I think there were tools or something that you, something that there were some images in the bottom there. Um, I don't know what they were for. I don't know if that's a hammer or what I'm seeing, but I just wanted to know um, if you could say more about this particular object. And and if what I'm seeing at the very bottom line is in fact true. The tools of justice, I guess, the scales and the hammer and gavel, um, mostly just, yeah. Um, for me, it was really important to relate some of my own experience in the, in the world on this piece. Um, I, I see it as sort of a self-portrait in some ways. Um, I, I've had a lot of family criminalized uh, unfairly for, I mean, stupid, stupid things that um, a lot of people don't have to worry about. Um, so this, this is just getting out some frustration uh, and telling a story um, through a beautiful object that sort mm -hmm. of lures people in with this very classical styling and then delivers a, oh, by the way, let's do better. Yeah, it's stunning. It's, I, I think it's like an object. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it available on the website? Can I see it on the website? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's in a private collection right now. Um, so I... I <laughs> it, I, it, it, it might live on my website. Uh, I, I think I have a photo of it up on my website. Uh, all right, great. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? I just wanted to say that I think that, first of all, I think a lot of the sort of moving towards a world where everything is curated. Um, and I think that, you know, I know that I always want to drink out of a cup that I find beautiful mm -hmm. or a glass that I want to look at all the time. And you know, as I go through my life, I rid myself of those pieces that don't matter anymore. Um, I think being able to spoon something from a jar that's made by you, a spoon made by you, um, elevates the whole experience of taking that item out of the jar. And I think that's all about history, I mean, silver mm -hmm. and metal and the history of, of all of that, you know, I mean, that's, I, I think, very important, has always been important in people's lives. So in some ways, I think part of the definition of functional and not functional, I mean, someone could take any of these and put things in them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. not to do because we think that we should not, but, you know, alone in a space Maybe you would fill some of these things with something else that you loved, or just because you thought that would look great in there. And I, and I, so I think that the blur is happening. I think that we don't think necessarily about functional and non-functional. I think we start. We're starting to think more about whether it's made by a person. We talk about farmers. I've done a lot of work with artists and makers and farmers, and you know, there's a similarity between knowing. Knowing who's growing your food and who's making that beautiful cup mm -hmm. that you're choosing to blend. And I think that's where hopefully we are going, you know, because the meaning, the, the, the meaning envelopes so many other things, like a vessel, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, of what that item is and, and why it exists in your life. Or in your life. Lots and lots of things to say, but I, but we talked a lot about filling vessels, um, and I did want to say, in fact, your work for me as a kid, which is making vessels for God, um, which is a really incredible um, and, and powerful, a powerful way of, of healing a cross. Like, first of all, by making it something, and then by making it as an object that is meant to contain something that no one can fill it. Someone. No, I just wanted to. I just wanted to introduce him. Well, I want to thank everyone for. Oh, Ron. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs>
It, you know, it it gives it gives access as well as being a receiving um, object or notion or memory. It, it's holding, but also whatever it's holding is available. And I think that that is that duality that the vessel um, presents the idea of the vessel. I think when when I read that, that's the last one. Oh, for your light, right? Um, I don't really think of it as empty. I think of it as open. Like I'm an open. I'm I'm open. I'm trusting. You know, and I think to be true, you know, truly creative, you have to be open and and trusting to experiences and and you know. Things happening, and also you're you're just you're an open you're an open vessel. You're you're allowing yourself to not be closed off and to allow experience to come through. Allow and maybe sift through the things that are important and not important, and throw those away so you have more space for the things that are important and continue on. Sid, that was beautiful. Um, what, yeah, I, I, I love this idea of, of uh, being open to receiving so that you can then give from what you've received. Uh, that's, uh, that, that really touched me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just same thing they all said, but yeah, it's definitely, it's very much both. Um, it's, I mean, a few of you have said you pour yourself into your work. So there's that pouring as well as being poured into um, and anything that's contained is going from one container to another to another and in and out of containers. I mean, it's going from grapes to a winery. I don't know how wine is made and then barrels and then bottles and then your wine glass and then your body and then the toilet. And <laughs> so I got a little off track there, but the, it's pouring forth and pouring forward as well as being poured into. Um, and yeah, I like the idea of sifting too. Yeah. One of my favorite vessels are planters. Mm -hmm. And what do they have? Drainage holes. <laughs> Very so, important. So you can think about that in terms of this receiving and presenting and then that exit. So I love planters because of that. On a, uh, on a less poetic version, a colander is a vessel for pasta yes. but not for water. So yes, <laughs> love that. And you got to pour the pasta back out of the colander into the pot. That could be you. <laughs> now you're making me hungry. So. Uh, yes, it is. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, and thank you to our panelists. Um, this was as Nava one of Nava's favorite terms for one of these great talks is it was so nutritious um i thank you all for your 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 thoughts and your your the work that you do um and bringing beauty into this world and that's that's what we're here for growing and bringing beauty so thank you everyone
Peace.